Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I'm excited to introduce our guests. <clears throat> Named the first chairman of the Jordan Brand Advisory Board in January 2019, Larry Miller led Michael Jordan's $200 million basketball shoe company to become a $4 billion athletic apparel global powerhouse. After founding the Jordan brand at Nike in 1999, he was president of the Portland Trail Blazers from 2007 to 2012, and has served in leadership and advocacy roles for the Urban League, Junior Achievement, and Self Enhancement, Inc. In Jump, Miller begins his story with the violence of his 1960s West Philly upbringing and incarceration and shares his later opportunities of education, redemption, and success. His co-author, Lila Lacey, is a native of Philadelphia and graduated from Central High School. She earned a degree from the Howard University in Washington, D.C., where she studied psychology and human communications and also studied at New York's Bank Street Graduate School of Education. Lacey taught middle school for the New York Board of Education and later served as a business development manager for several mortgage banking firms in California. Till tonight, they'll be in conversation with Fat Joe, rapper, producer, platinum recording artist, and host of the Fat Joe Show. Please welcome Larry Miller, Layla Lacey, and Fat Joe. Both see that new gang here. <laughs> What's up, y'all? My name's Fat Joe. How y'all doing, Philly? What's going on? So we here for the man, not the myth, Larry Miller. Uh, I go back with Larry 20 plus years. Uh, I remember when I first met him, I'd be like, hey, hey, how you doing, Mr. Miller? Like, you know, like all proper and stuff. And uh, so when he gives me the call and, and t talks, well, I was, first of all, Larry, I was honored to receive a call from you, for you to even say, yo, Joe, I wrote a book, and it's about this. And we talked for like an hour, at least an hour or two, and he was breaking down this whole, I was like, no way. And he was like, Joe, what you think? I said, this is necessary. Because a lot of our people, especially the youth, they have to see it to believe it. Stories like what Larry got, it comes once in a in hundred years. And so it's important that uh, we keep the transparency with the wins, with the losses. Uh, and it's amazing that you, you have me, uh, I guess we hosting or curating, You're along with your beautiful daughter. Do you got a, uh, Max? Thank you. <laughs> Talk to the people. Hi, hi everybody. <laughs> Oh, she I'm not a talker, huh? I'm not much of a talker, um, but hopefully I'll, I'll get better. Um, I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces out there, so that's very comforting. I'm so thankful that y'all are here and are interested and want to read about this. Um, it was a long time, a lot of work put in on it, but um, here we are. So Philly, are you proud of Mr. Larry Miller? Yes. And, and, and Larry loves everybody, but this is truly black excellence right here. And uh, Larry, what made you finally say, I'm gonna write a book about my life and be as honest as you was in your book? A lot of people like to carve out stuff. What made you tell the real story? Well, first of all, <clears throat> if it wasn't for her, I probably wouldn't have done this. But she, wow. over the years, kept telling me, you know, Dad, you got a story that, uh, that people need to know. You need to share this story with people. And um, <clears throat> I kept like, no, nah, no, nah, because for, for 40 plus years, you know, I hid this story because uh, the folks I was working with, the world that I was in from a, from a corporate perspective, you know, I knew that this story wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't work there, you know what I mean? So I just kind of kept it in and did everything I could to hide it. But once she convinced me that, you know, this is a story that can help some people, that can resonate with some people, and maybe, 
you know, get some, some young folks to look at their lives a little bit differently. So, uh, so we, we, we agreed, she agreed to do it. And then we started working on it. It took us like 10, this was probably 10, 12, 13 years ago. We started, Wow. we would get together, um, and sit down and she'd ask questions and we'd talk and she would record it. Right. And then she'd go back and transcribe it. And we did this over 10, 12 years, maybe three or four times a year we would get together, it, basically on my schedule, because she'd be like, can we do I'm like, yeah, 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 and finally, like, all right, we can get together today. So we, we, uh, we, we started working on it. Like I said, we went through that for about 10, 10 years or so, and then at the end, we had this document, but it wasn't really in a book form. So it's mm. like, okay, now we got to figure out how to turn this into a book, and, and we did. But to me, you know, the main reason that, that I, decided to do this was because, you know, I wanted, number one, I wanted people to know that um, folks deserve a second chance and that people can change their life. You know what I mean? People can, you know, change their life and, and get on a positive path and do some, some positive things. The other thing, the other reason that, um, that we agreed to do this is because um, there, there's a certain stigma with having been incarcerated, with having been arrested, and a lot of times it keeps you from being able to get a job or get an education or to move forward. And so ho hopefully this story will resonate with some folks who make those kind of decisions and make them um, have maybe a different perception of, of, of formerly incarcerated people. And then, you know, there is, uh, hopefully to me, uh, you know, maybe there's a young 16-year-old uh, Larry Miller out there somewhere that's headed down the wrong path, about to do something stupid that he'll regret for the rest of his life. And maybe this will, to your, we were talking about this earlier, Joe, maybe they see this and it changes their mind or it makes them stop and think for a minute before they go out and do something that, like I said, they're gonna regret for the rest of their life. So, you know, we, we, we and once we decided to do it, you know, um, like, I, I'm, I'm the kind of person, if I do something, I'm not going to half-ass do it. I'm not going to half-step, you know what I mean? So once we decided to do it, it's like, okay, we're going we're gonna to put it all out there, you know what I mean? And, uh, and, and that's what we did. Beautiful, man. Twelve years. Twelve years in the making. Um, so one thing you said that's really, really that resonates with me and really pounds my skull is uh, a second chance. And, and the they third always and a, say and it's the third possible. And the fourth and the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> they always, <laughs> you know, the American dream. Uh, you know, when I was a little kid, we would watch cartoons and they would be like, a million dollars. Like, it's always a million dollars. Till you get a million dollars and you, and you spend it in a year and go broke. And you think you own like a cloud. And, a, and, and the, the, the second chance reminds me of that same thing because they always say it's a second chance, but is there really a second chance? Do people really, you know, once you like have a reputation, it seems to follow you forever and uh, and nobody really wants to um, hug you and embrace you and give you a second chance. So that resonated. Um, so you started out here in Philly. Would we say uh, you was hanging with the wrong crowd? <laughs> I, I would say I was. Part of the wrong crowd. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> no, no, you know, from uh, from like all through elementary school, man, I was uh, I was like straight A student, you know, teacher's pet kind of kind of kid. But somewhere like 11, 12, 13 years old, um, the Lord of the Street just kind of pulled me in, man. I just, you know, the whole element of like being cool and being out there in the street, and before I knew it. <clears throat> You know, my goal was to impress people in the street versus teachers and parents at that point. Up to that point, it had been, you know, I want to impress the teachers and parents, but it started to shift. And then I, I remember, uh, I, I don't know if Butch and Tyrone are here today, but uh, two of my, my friends, they, Butch called me up there about a couple months ago. He's like, yo, you remember the day we decided we were going to go down and join Cedar Avenue? I said, yeah, I remember that day. <laughs> me, me, Butch, and Tyrone decided we were going to go down and join Cedar Avenue, and we did. And, uh, and you know, I just, once I, once I got into it, I, I got all the way into it. Man, and uh, I can relate. 
And, uh, and unfortunately, same old story of especially your time and my time, because I, I remember growing up in the Bronx where it looked like a war zone. Like, you know, the, 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 there was no playgrounds. It was just rubble, right? And so I remember being ambitious, too, as a kid, just saying, yo, I'm going to get rich or die trying. Like, I'm, like, this poor thing ain't for me. And so I understand. And then, and then all we had to look up to was the number man, the hustler, the toughest guy got the power. Was that true in your life as well? Like, was you getting more popular or for some reason they were, like, looking up to you because the crazier you got? Yeah, I mean, for, for us, it really wasn't about, um, about money. You know what I mean? It was more about um, this is, you know, we put, laid claim to a territory, and it was about, it was really about brotherhood. It was about being a part of a, a brotherhood. I mean, you know, we were willing to live and die for each other back at that point, you know? And um, like I said, it, wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't really about money for us. It was more about, hey, I want to belong to something, and, you know, this was what, what was there for us to belong to. And, and you know, the, the good thing, I mean, in, in our neighborhood, like, you know, we ain't let nobody else come in the neighborhood, but we looked out for the people in the neighborhood. You know, oh, chill out, man. Here comes so-and-so, mom. Be cool, be cool, be cool, be cool. How you doing, Miss So-and-so? Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. So she walked by, all right, my boy, man. You know what I mean? But, but it was like, that was, that was how we rolled in the neighborhood back then. That's traditional gangsterism. Yeah. Like, guys like John Gotti. <laughs> you know, his neighborhood was safe as hell out there, boy. But they throw parties out there when he was out there. Um, so at what point did you get incarcerated again and again and again uh, until the, the major thing? So, so, so the first time I ever got busted was... Uh, <laughs> busted! <laughs> I, 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 pardon, pardon me. The fir, the no, first, no, 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 that's the, the talk. That's <laughs> the first time that's I the was error, ever, that's that talk. <laughs> like, I haven't heard busted in a while. The first time I yeah. was ever arrested, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> arrested. No, no, um... Me and, me and Tyrone, me and Tyrone stole a bike, and we took it to Tyrone's backyard. And we're in the backyard stripping the bike down, and this lady walks up and says, uh, can I see that bike? Everybody's like, oh, shit. So we start running. I run through the house and come out the front door. As soon as I come out the front door, there's a cop waiting there for me with wow. his gun drawn. He's like, you know, stop while I blow your brains out. So, of course, I stopped. And that was the first time I ever had a contact with the, the police. So I ended up getting probation for that. But then we joined the gang, and uh, from that point on, I was just like, you know, every time, every so often, I'd get busted for something. And then, you know, when I was 16, I, I shot a kid and killed him. And I went to jail. I was tried as uh, an adult uh, and sentenced to four and a half years, uh, four and a half to 20 years. I did the four and a half, most of that up at Camp Hill, which folks here know what Camp Hill is. Um, did the four and a half, got out. Uh, Knocked around, doing a bunch of stuff here and there, in and out again. Um, and then uh, I joined the Nation of Islam. And that kind of turned my life around. I, I, you know, I stopped using drugs, stopped smoking, stopped drinking, all that. And I, I sold fish, uh, went door bean to door. Bean pies. Bean pies, fish, papers, that, that was me. And then, you know, at a certain point, um, I started to feel like I wanted to do more for the nation financially. So the only thing I knew was to get back into criminal stuff, and, that, and that's what I did. I started, you know, you know, selling drugs and extorting money and robbing people, and um, that's what ended, landed me back in jail. When I went back the last time, uh, I had like four or five robbery charges. Um, ended up getting sentenced to four to, 20, four to 10 years. Also, the, the crazy thing is when I, when I, so I still had 15 and a half years of back time to walk off. The way it worked here in Pennsylvania, I don't know if it's still that way, but if you're on parole, let's say I had four and a half to 20, so I had 15 and a half years that I had to walk off. Once I got busted again, like five years later, they took that five years away, and I still now had 15 and a half years of back time Ooh. all over again. But I've been so blessed in my life, man, that um, they could have made me do the whole 15 or any part of that 15 and they only asked, made me do nine months out of that 15. So I did the nine months and then started the four year sentence. But when I was there, they had this program, uh, it was an educational, they had work release and education release where you could um, live outside the jail in these trailers and leave every day 
and go to work or go to school, and you just had to be back by eight o'clock at night. And uh, there was, and I, so finally I ended up, I figured out how I could get into that program. And for me, the, the motivation for getting into that program was, I, I'm, I'm a, instead of being in the jail, I'm be living out there and able to go out every day. But once I kind of got into it and started taking the classes and really started to think about whether or not I could really change my life, that really was what did it for me. I ended up in that program and uh, went to com community college in Montgomery County, left every day. Uh, matter of fact, at one point I became a driver, so you drive people and p come back and forth, and we had to be back by eight o'clock. There were a lot of days, it'd be 7, 59, 59, and we'd be pulling up in that bad boy. <laughs> because if you were late, you go back inside. And there were a lot of days we made it by the skin of our teeth, but we, we, we made it back. And then um, I transferred down to a halfway house in North Philly at uh, 15th and Columbia, and I started going to Temple, working on my mm. bachelor's degree. And, um, and all along, you know, I'm st I was still a little bit, you know, kind of walking the fence a little bit. Let me, let me interrupt for a second. <laughs> that's technically, we, that's technically really hard to do, right? So you come out of prison, you was doing the right thing because you were in prison, major key, you realized in prison, Hey, I'm kind of smart. Like, I'm kind of good at this, right? Exactly. But when you come home, it's the same old story. The minute the guy could be clean, he went to jail for five years, he comes home and Tito's like, Larry, I got it. I got the stuff. Blow your mind, the high powered, bro. How did you navigate from those guys? Telling you, Larry, come back, man. What are you talking about? You, you know, you know. Um, most of the reality is, most of my friends, most of the people that that I know who knew me, they were encouraging me to do the right thing. Mm. They were they were encouraging me, like, hey, you know what? And and you know, there were a couple times, like I thought about, you know, or oh, I never forget. There was one time when I I knew I was done, right? Um, some brothers had asked me to set up a meeting with uh, with this brother uh, that I knew from in jail, and um, so I set up the meeting. We go down to his, to to uh, he, he was set up in the pool room. We go down to the pool room, and we go in, and um, I kind of introduce everybody, and then I was standing there, and I was just like, "Why why, why am I here? I don't belong. I was already working for Campbell Soup at the time. I was like, you know, this this don't feel right. So I said, you know what? I wait for y'all outside, and I went out and let them handle what they were handling. And then from that point on, because you know, I knew if my heart wasn't in it, if I was half-stepping, that wasn't gonna work for me. You know, I mean, that's dangerous. If you're in that world and you ain't, you ain't really about it. So that's when I kind of knew, you know what, I, I'm, I'm gonna stay focused on trying to, do, trying to do it this way. That's crazy, right? Because I have a story that's similar. And growing up in the projects, I was always, so now I know why, who Fat Joe, why he's Fat Joe, right? And so I would always be like the mediator. So these guys could, this guy is going to kill this guy, this guy's going to kill, somehow they would always call me. And I would end up in the middle of guys with guns pointed at each other. And I'm like, yo, chill, yo, hold up, yo, we could do, and we, and we would always work it out. And it's crazy because at one point they came to me and they said, and this isn't too long ago, right? <laughs> they came to me and said, the only guy they respect is you. This guy's going to kill, and these guys are killers. Like, they're going to, it's going to be the biggest war. But both of them said they'll only sit down with Fat Joe and this and this and that. And I said, listen, guys, you see that guy? He said, yeah, he's a retired cop. Okay. And he's my security, and I'm a rapper. I'm not about to get in the middle of some killers <laughs> and start mediating nothing. That's over. No, but you like us, you will get. It's over, bro. Mm -hmm. I ain't having guys point guns. At, you know, in my. It's over for me. That's when I knew, finally, like, yo, I'm out Joe's of out of yeah, this thing, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But but I, I like I said, I have to say, man, most of my friends, most of you know, corner boys, brothers from, from the Nation of Islam, everybody was supportive. When they saw what I was trying to do and that, you know, I was trying to, you know, make, make a move in the, in the right direction, 
I, I got a lot of support from people. Man, it's so crazy, man. I, I was in the supermarket with my wife the other day, and I wanted a Campbell's soup. <laughs> and she said, you always eating bad. That stuff got so much salt in it. <laughs> and so how do you transition from Campbell's soup to becoming the chairman of Brand Jordan? How, how did this, these steps take place? So, so when, I, um, when I was about to graduate from Temple, uh, the, way they, the way they set it up, like, um, you know, on campus in your last semester, all these companies come on campus to, uh, to interview for jobs. And, and, and I, I, I'm a, I learned um, early on, like, if you want to be good at something, you got to practice it because practice makes you confident and confidence is what makes you good at whatever it is you do. So I took a bunch of interviews with companies that I knew I didn't want to work for. For whatever reason, I knew I didn't want to work with those company, for those companies. But I took those interviews to get the practice and to get the confidence. And so by the time the companies came on campus that I was interested in, I, I was killing it. Because I, 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 knew, I knew what to say. I knew the right answers to all the questions. You knew what they wanted. I knew what like, they wanted right. to hear, and I was giving it to them. And so, uh, but then there was... Um, so at, back at that, my, my undergrad degree is in accounting. So I'm an accountant by trade. That's what I was. You didn't, you didn't know that, did you? No, I wouldn't have went to jail if I knew accounting. <laughs> if I knew you at that, if I knew you was an accountant, I wouldn't have went to jail for taxes. <laughs> Should have talked to me, brother. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> but um, but so 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 um, at the time there was what was called the big eight accounting firms, and if you were an accounting student, that's who you wanted to work for. And so, uh, so I, I had interviewed with a bunch of accounting firms, and it was one, Arthur Anderson, who I was really interested in working for. So I, I go to their office. Um, they invite me. I go through a full day of interviews, <clears throat> and I'm killing it. I'm killing it. They love no, it. Di no disrespect, Larry. Are you answering the question, have you ever been incarcerated? No, I'm getting to that. Okay. Getting Sorry that. about that. I'm getting to that. Getting to I that. don't want to steal your now, thunder. That, that, I'm getting to that. That's, that that's, that's the story. So I go through this whole day of, of interviews. They love me. It's good. And then um, I get to the last guy who's like the hiring manager. This is the guy that's going, you know. So, I, so the whole day, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, should I say something to these folks or not? Should I just, you know, should I say something about it? So finally, I get to the last guy, and we talk, and so I'm like, okay, I'm going to say it. So I start to tell him about my past, and I'm going through and talking to him about it. And as I'm talking, I could see his face changing. You know what I mean? I could see his face changing. And for I'm the like, best or for the worst? For the worst. I could Dang. see his face. I could just see, like, okay. And then I finally get, I keep talking, and finally I get through, and he says, uh, he said, wow, that's, that's an amazing story, and, you know, and I'm sure you're going to do great. He reached in his pocket. He said, you know, I have an offer letter here that I was all set to give you, but I can't give it to you now. He said, I can't take the chance of, you know, something happening. Blah. He said, I wish you the best. But, and at that point, I was like, I'm never going to say anything about this again. If it comes out, and when I started working for Campbell Soup, the question was, have you been convicted of a crime in the last five years? Well, the answer was no. Because I've been longer than five mm. years, and so I was able to it's answer a loophole. that loophole. I was able to exactly. I was able to answer that question no, and that's how I started working for Campbell Soup. And then as I went forward, um, there was very few. That, that nobody ever asked me about that again. I was based on my resume or whatever. So you know, I never. I didn't really lie about it. I just didn't say anything, and that's what for years had me nervous worried and concerned that it would come out. As I was building my career, you know, I'm worried that at some point, um, you know, somebody's going to hear about this or somehow it's going to come out. And uh, fortunately for me, it never did. But, but that was what, and for, for years, you know, I had nightmares and migraines wow. and all because I was holding all this in and worried about the fact that, you know, somebody would hear it would come it, out it, somehow. It feels like them classic movies when you, you with the team, you work, and they were like, Larry, <laughs> you know, Bang Bang City, baby. <laughs> we like, you like, no way. Like, yeah. and, you and, probably was missing the Philly events. Like, you was like, no, 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 no. No Jordan parties in Philly. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 no. We still came to Philly. We still, no, but you know what? You know what I, what I have to say? And, and somebody said this to me one time, but my Philly homies, nobody ever said anything. Man. There was one time, um, a friend of mine, this, this brother George Hill, we, I talked about George a little bit earlier today with somebody, but 
George was uh, one of my, from my gang growing up. Um, and then George went in the military and then he joined, joined the sheriff's department. So when I would get busted, George would be the one like take, moving me around and moving me from cell to cell. But he was all, we were always cool. He would bring me stuff, look out for me. And then when I was at uh, Greaterford, which is the penitentiary here, George used to come up there with boxing programs. He would referee and come up with, for, because George was, was, was in the boxing. And, um, and then when I got out and I started working with Roy Jones, I, held, I hooked George up with him where he was using George to ref some fights wow. and stuff. And uh, this, I was at a game one time. This is when I was with the Trailblazers, and I was at a game. And um, By the way, he was the, the boss of the Portland Trailblazers. I don't know if y'all know that. He was, at, he was at Jordan. One of my worst days of my life was when he called me and said, Joe, I'm going to be the boss of the Portland Trailblazers. I said, man, I blew my connect at Jordan, man. <laughs> he said, if you ever want to come to a game, I said, man, I ain't going to no Portland. Come to a Trailblazer. Come on, man. Larry, man. <laughs> Listen, we the, the scale done tip, man. Like, no, but um, you made me lose my train of thought. Oh, I'm sorry about <laughs> George Hill. <laughs> George, oh, so George, George. Um, so, so I was at a game, I'm Trailblazers, and I, I get a tap on the shoulder, and I turn around, this brother I know, uh, been known him for years, good brother. He said, uh, he said, man, he said, you know a guy named George Hill? I said, yeah, I know George. He said, man, you need to tell George to chill. He said, George is bragging about you, man. He's telling people what, how great you, he said, but I ain't gonna say nothing, but somebody else might, you know what I mean? Yeah. He said, so, so I, and, and uh, that brother, to his credit, he never said anything else to anybody else. He said, told me, never said anything. I called George the next day. I was like, yo, man, I know you're bragging and stuff, but and he was like, oh, I ain't know, man. And George was cool from that point on. But if, if, if George had talked to somebody else, that might have been a whole different thing. You know, boy, I, what I noticed is a lot of people can't keep a secret. As much as they think they can keep a secret. So if you got a good secret, keep it to yourself. Because, <laughs> man, it, it's just human nature. Um, then we, I'll we, tell you about one, one other time. So... <clears throat> So when Obama was president, um, there's a guy that worked at Nike who uh, is like the lobbyist for Nike in D.C. And he, he, you know, he works with all the people. He worked with Obama. And all. So Obama was coming to Portland uh, to actually to speak out at Nike on campus at Nike. And the night before, he was having like a little reception uh, at one of the hotels downtown. So, so dude said, hey, man, they want you to come to the event with Obama. Uh, I, all right, so you know, I, I sent him my information, but all the time I'm I'm scared to death, right? Because that's the secret, camera, secret cameras. See, this was yeah, this this was uh, this was Obama's last year in office, actually. So I'm waiting, waiting. This the uh, event is on Thursday. That Wednesday, I still haven't heard anything. I'm like, okay, I guess maybe. So I'm driving in my car, and I get a call, and it's this guy. Uh, his name is Jesse. He said, uh, he said, hey man, uh, Secret Service just called me. He said, um. He said, what, what's your middle name? I said, uh, my middle name is Garland. Sheesh. It's Gar Garland. That was my grandfather's name. I said, it's Garland. He said, oh, you good, man. He said, there's this Larry G. Miller dude that got all kind of felonies and shit against him. And He's a bad I dude. <laughs> I was like, uh, okay. He said, but you good, man. You good. I said, all right. And the next night, I went and saw Obama and met Obama. <laughs> but, but. But I mean, I somehow know, I know. they didn't they didn't put it together. Somehow they I didn't. No, this guy come, man. This guy, this this is like a movie. This reminds me of like the movie Malcolm X, right? Because there was this white guy. He was on me. He was like, man, this is guy Obama, and we need the Latinos, and we need the and and they, he hyped me up, man. And I was going all over, yo, man, y'all gotta vote for Barack. This telling all the Spanish people this and this and that. And I tell this guy one time, I said, yo, man, when can I meet? He wasn't even president. He said, oh, no, you can't meet Barack Obama. <laughs> he said, you and uh, a couple of your guys, I can't meet him. I said, damn, I'm on the list. He <laughs> scared the hell out of me, right? <laughs> um, and so at what point, uh, because we, ain't, we, we, we gotta get back. You was in Campbell's, mm -hmm. at, at what point uh, did you meet with Brand Jordan, and how did you rise through the ranks in Brand Jordan? So, 
when I when I, I, I was worked at Campbell Soup, I worked for Kraft Foods, a couple other places, and then I ended up um, working for a company called Janssen. And Janssen makes swimwear, sportswear, and they were headquartered in Portland. So I started out at Janssen as the controller, because again, accounting background, right? Mm. And, um, and I was there uh, about two, three years after I was there, they actually uh, fired the guy who was the president and they put me into the president role, right? But w before that happened, one of the things I had gotten involved in, me, me and some guys were sitting around one day trying to figure out how we could grow our business, right? And one of the things we came up with was an idea to do um, like competition swimwear. So what we were doing was stuff you wear on the beach or on the, on the cruise ship. But then they wanted, uh, we, we, we came up with this idea to do the Speedo type stuff that they wear in the Olympics, right? Mm. And, um, and I was like, you know what, we should talk to Nike, see? Because we were in Portland, they were in Portland. I was like, we, so we, long story short, we ended up connecting with Nike. I met the guy who headed up all of the apparel for Nike. Mm. And um, after uh, about a year or so in that role, about because about, I ended up at Janssen for five years, uh, he reached out to me and said, hey, would you ever consider coming to work for Nike. Mm. I was like, absolutely. That was sexier than Jensen, <laughs> yeah. right? So, so I start, my first job at Jensen was, I mean, at Nike was the head of apparel in North America, in the US. And uh, that was about a billion dollar business at the time. So I was like, hey, I do that. And about a year and a half in, um, <clears throat> MJ was about to retire from the Bulls for the last time. Hold on, 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 because this is crucial. You get the job at Nike. Nike's Nike, and we love Nike, right? But then Jordan is a brand within Nike. But it wasn't that way when I started. That's, that's, that, was whole, that was the whole deal. When I started there, Jordan was a logo kind of under Nike mm. basketball. So they had Jordan logo, Wings logo. They had all these logos under Nike basketball. And... <clears throat> When MJ was about to retire, uh, my main man, H. White, mm. H. was like, you know, hey, it is. He, he was one of the main proponents of the fact that he thought there was life after MJ's retirement days for the brand. And me and him talked a lot mm. about it. And so we convinced Phil Knight, H. mainly, but convinced Phil Knight that we could do something with that logo after Michael's plan days. And uh, so I was asked to put a team together and strategies on how we were going to create a brand, basically. Had anybody else done this before? No. No Charles no. Barkley? No. No, no. And oh, we better watch what we say. Charles is diss us. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he ready to go. <laughs> and, 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 and especially uh, with a player that was retired. You know, MJ was retiring. So now, matter of fact, most of the people, a lot of the people at Nike, a lot of our customers all, they thought it was crazy that we were trying to do this. I remember one guy... Went, we went and did our pitch to him, a retailer, and he said, uh, he said, man, I'm going to go with y'all on this because I feel like I have to because it's Nike. He said, but this will never work. Two years later, I saw him at Magic, at the Magic show. He's like, man, I owe you an apology. I said, for what? He said, well, I, I, no, I told you this wasn't going to work, but I was wrong, and, and can I get some more Jordans? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, that's how the brand actually got started, and um, – you know, I was fortunate enough to put an incredible team of people together. Uh, Phil Knight accused me of, of cherry picking the organization. No, nah, it was it was it was the first time I seen. Uh, no disrespect, a bunch of black Obamers, like really really smart guys, and when you had your team, it was it was it was. If you ain't see it, you was you was everybody was like. A, Intelligent black man, mm. intelligent black sister, intelligent black, and you knew that you you was building something that we had never seen before. That, that wasn't by mistake, Joe. Right, but talk, elaborate, Larry. <laughs> no, that wasn't by mistake. I mean, when we started out, that was the goal. First of all, to build, you know, a team that was diverse in its nature and make sure that we had, because because our. our we, we knew who our target consumer was, right? Mm. Our target consumer was that kid in the hood, black, brown kid in the hood, uh, who was the leader on his team, the baller, the mm. best dresser. That's who we targeted. And so to me, it's like in order to talk to that kid, we got to be able to communicate with him. We got to know who he is. And the best way to do that is for us to be involved That's in right. it. 
And, um, and so we, we, we put together a team of uh, incredible, incredible team of people. Still got some of them, uh, H, still Reggie. I mean, just Reggie. folks like. They're Jeff just Reed. all smart guys. I don't know how to explain <laughs> it to you. These guys are telling you. You sit with them for one second. But they, they even introduced me to a new guy. Yo, Joe, this is Reginald. He's like, I know he's smart already. Like, I know, <laughs> yo, this guy's smart. Like, he's the smartest guy. And so uh, it was. Uh, I don't know if I want to jump off into something else, but nah, I, I, I won't. It, so in a sense, you build such a powerful team. That, did you ever get like rejection or flack or energy from Nike, the the mothership? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Because they, 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 I mean, could yeah, you no. speak on it? Yeah, no, a large part of, um, so... The way we looked at it and the way we approached it is uh, Nike didn't need another Nike brand. So we need to be something different. And mm -hmm. a lot of times they didn't get it because we would do stuff that they that that Nike brand maybe couldn't or wouldn't do. And, but we could because we're Jordan. And um, I think that that made a ma major difference. But there were there was a lot of there was a lot of struggles inside. A lot, a lot of a lot, lot of hesitant. But you know this, uh, maybe I'm jumping far ahead, but you know this is no longer a black and brown kid wearing the Jordan. Oh, I know. You know I go in the whitest of Oklahomas <laughs> and the white boys is wearing the Jordans like all I, day. I, 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 I totally agree. But what, what we believed, and I still believe this now, is that trends, fashion starts in the hood. Oh, yeah. And then it goes. Oh, yeah. It, 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 you know, the, 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 the fashions, the trends, they all start there and then they go. So we believe that, hey, if we get this kid who starts the trends, then everybody else going to follow. And, and, and you're absolutely right. Now, I mean, Jordans are everywhere and everybody's into it and everybody's buying them. And that's, that's fantastic for us. But I think if we had not started out with that focus on who our consumer was, we, we wouldn't have been able to build it. Man, that's an amazing thing. Um, and so people don't get to see that. People don't get to see uh, how the emphasis was on building the brand uh, after retirement and, 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 and hiring brothers and sisters. And uh, you know, I, think, I think MJ always gets it. You know, we always, you know, uh, even when you help, you get criticized. <laughs> That's the craziest thing about black and brown people, that even when you help, when you step out and you help, you know, you still get criticized. Uh, could you tell us some of the things you worked on with MJ and the company, company of being philanthropy, uh, philanthropy, how you give back to the community, um, generate jobs and all that? Because people need to hear, hear that about MJ because they never, they, 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 there's something, there's something. I don't know. There's something out there where they lie to themselves and say that MJ don't look out for the people and all that. But it would be important for you to say that. Uh, I, uh, to me, um, first of all, you know, he was he, he he was one who was pushing like, hey, we need to make sure that we hire the right people and people that look like us. He, he was he was 100 percent on board with that and pushing that when we were putting the team together. Um, <clears throat> You know, the other thing, when we first started, uh, we, we realized that we had to and we wanted to give back to the community. So from the very beginning, uh, we started with a, um, a program that was called the Jordan Fundamentals. And it basically was grants for teachers. Because when we talked to MJ about it, so, hey, how he said, man, we should, we should help teachers. Because he, he said teachers have been instrumental in his life, and he wanted to help teachers. And so we put together this program where we would give grants, teachers could apply for grants, and we would give these teachers grants. And we did a minimum of at least a million dollars a year. That was the, that was the goal at the time we were getting started. And, um, <clears throat> and so we had that program, and now we've got a program in place right now. Uh, it's called the Wing Scholarship Program. I mean, we do, do a bunch of stuff, and have always done a bunch of stuff in the community. MJ has been leading the charge on that. But we got this, we've got a program now, it's called a Jordan Wing Scholarship, where we provide a full free ride to kids. So we, it started actually right here in Philly. Um, I was here in Philly, I was at a, a meeting with a guy who 
owned a company called Villa. I'm sure you guys all know the shoe sneaker store Villa. Uh, the sneakerheads in here know. <laughs> Two up front right here, they know. We know Villa. Uh, we know um, Villa. <laughs> but um, we know Total Sports. <laughs> Right, remember they started. You know, Philly started the, the fitted caps. Oh, I know with the different colors and all that I know. on Broad I know. Street. But yeah, man, we know about Philly, man. So, we know about <laughs> so, so I was meeting with the guy who runs Villa, and um, you know, I said, you know, we we all these kids are so uh, connected to our brand. They're so in, enthusiastic about our brand. How do we use that to motivate them? from an education perspective, school. So we started this program with them called A's for J's, where kids could actually earn credits towards Jordan product by getting good grades and attendance. And, and we started right here in Philly with three, it was uh, West Philly and Hotep and um, Kensington. We, so three schools right here in Philly we started with and we expanded it. But <clears throat> once we kind of realized that, yeah, we could help these kids get through high school, but what about after high school? What if there are kids who have the ability, the desire, but they don't have the financial wherewithal to go to college? And so we came up with a program where we provide a full free ride. And we now work, we're in, I think, eight or nine cities now. We work with community organizations, and they funnel these kids up to us, and then we provide these scholarships. We've probably got, we're probably getting close to 500 kids now that we put through wow. this program. And every year we add another 30 or 40 kids to this program every year. You know, it ain't cute uh, to brag about philanthropy. It ain't cute. Uh, you know, you heard that, right? I see some Muslim brothers in here, and they, they're Muslims. They, they're beautiful people, and they, they, they give back. It's almost like haram. It's like a bad thing to brag about uh, giving back. But I think that's something definitely... Um, that needs to be heard in the hood because they, you know, it's like that. I'm going to tell you my, one of my amazing MJ stories. So I know Larry Miller 20 some years. I know everybody in the business and they always cool with me. So one day I say to myself, I'm going to invest in the hood and I'm going to open a sneaker store because I'm a big sneaker collector and all that natural transition. So without telling nobody, I build a store in Harlem. White marble, gold chandeliers, smells like a million bucks when you get in there. Like, I'm, not, I, I'm doing my thing. And, uh, and so I tell some Nike guys that I was cool with for 20-something years, I say, yo, you know, I'm, I opened a store. They was like, really? I said, yeah, like a sneaker store. They was like, who do you speak to? And I was like, um, nobody. I thought we cool, <laughs> 20 years. Like, what are you talking about? It's like, no, it don't go like that. Like, you either get grandfathered in or you need special permission or you need, like, you need to be vetted, right? They, right? I was like, oh, no. I spent like a couple of hundred thousand <laughs> in that thing. I was really, I said, wow. Ain't people really fronted on me, right? I thought we was cool like that, right? And I'm trying to do the right thing, get some jobs in the hood, right? Because we too much trying to run out of the hood and not invest in the hood, right? And so, so I like to lead by example. So I go, two days later, you was there. They threw a party, Rand Jordan threw a party for uh, Neiman, the soccer player, mm -hmm. Neiman no, Jr. No, 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 I remember it was uh, Neymar. Neymar Jr. We, and we were at that house. I was in there, yeah, it yeah. was like a, a I still thing. got that a picture, me, you, Reggie, MJ, and Fabulous. I got a picture of five that, of us. That was, that, that was every, it, it, so it's like a hundred <clears throat> people, right? And so I'm up in there. You know, I got a lot of pride too. You know, I don't ask for things, right? So somebody screams over the whole room. Goes, Big Joe, because he never called me Fat Joe. He called me Big Joe, MJ, all the time, right? <laughs> he said, Big Joe. So everybody's looking, right? You got a cigar in his hand. He said, he said your store. I'll be at the grand opening. I'm coming to the grand opening. It was so crazy. I don't know who told MJ they fronting on your boy. That was you, Larry? <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> oh. How did you how did you know they was like, yo, they fronting on your boy? He was like, yo, I'm coming. And the guys who fronted on me ran over and said, I guess you got a store. <laughs> you think he's really coming? They That's told they they told me and I told MJ, I was like, yo, man, we're gonna be, Joe gonna get the store. He's like, I'll be there to open it. 
Man, that's crazy, man. And uh, we've been blessed ever since. And in a, in a similar fashion, we just, uh, oh, okay, brother. Okay. And so um, we just opened our third store in the Bronx in the hood across the street from the projects and all that. <laughs> and we built, we built a, a, a educational school inside the store where we have computers for the students that don't own computers. Mm. Okay. So you know when the COVID went down, they talking about go virtual, these kids don't got computers. Mm -hmm. So we've been back, door we've been selling, um, um, buying a million laptops and giving them to the, all the teachers, quiet is kept. And so we just say, yo, you know what? These kids ain't got no uh, computers. So we opened up like a, a, and then now it's an after school program, like with professional teachers mm coming in there. They needed it. It's necessary. So we got four tickets, four questions uh, from the audience. There has been an excessive amount of killing of our youths in the city. The teens are killing each other. What do you suggest we do to reach the youth? I'll talk about that today. That's the uh, You want to talk about that? Wow, that's, that's, that's huge. Um, I know we can all, as individuals, just do our best to look out for each other, look out for the children, the child that we see that doesn't have anybody looking out for them. Um, that's just kind of on an individual level, but I really do think that there's more that the cities can do to provide safe spaces for these children. Um, I think there's, I just, it, it, that's such a large, um, many-sided question, um, but that's just two things that come to mind, is that maybe there's more that can be done on it, you know, I, I feel like it's kind of a political issue now, and so it's, it may or may not get the right kind of attention these days, even though it's getting a lot of attention. And they killing out here. They kill Hard. every day. Every day. And, they killing um, women in New York. At a fast, the, the women in the Philly bodega, too. they shoot her. They they beating them up. They killing them. They robbing them for a hundred dollars. And it's, it's like, like what is making these people do this? Yeah, it's, we don't. That's a really hard question. Um, but I know one thing that I personally can do is just be that pair of eyes and that pair of hands to help somebody when I see that they need it. I mean, that, that also. Well, um, you know, one of the reasons that that we decided to do this book project was um, hopefully it will, you know, help. It will maybe make some people think a little bit or stop and think about what they're about to do and realize that, you know, they may be about to do something that they're going to regret for the rest of their life. I mean, I, I for the rest of my life, I've regretted the fact that I took the life of a young black man. I mean, I think about that all the time because... Um, you know, to me, there's enough going on against us as it is for us to be killing each other. I mean, that, that's just, you know, uh, it, it, we, we don't stand a chance if we keep doing that. They, they, they got so many guns pointing at us, and then when we point them at ourselves and point them at each other, that just makes it that much more worse. So, you know, I'm, I'm, one of my hopes is that, you know, this, this, this book and what we're trying to generate out of this will definitely, um, you know, maybe help to curb some of this. Yes. I believe in love. I believe in love and inspiration. And so uh, pull a youth to the side. Um, it's, it's amazing that so many years ago you alluded to we from Cedar Block, right? But we don't really own Cedar Block, right? And so... See, um, see that, see that avenue, Joe. See that avenue. Yeah. <laughs> I got. It. You know, I got. It. I know Fifth and Allegheny, man. That's what I know. <laughs> what well, my man Tony and Johnny's? What's the restaurant over there? Tierra Colombiana. You know, I know about that spot. Uh, and so, um, I just think we gotta show love to the youth. Another thing is, uh, we all know we was crazy when we was young, obviously. And so it takes a time.
for kids to mature and to think past uh, the violence that's happening and, at the time. So we just got to fight with them and, and, and embrace them and show them love. And then when you say gangs, right, it, where are we going to, you know, we, we, you know, we could do the Puerto Rican parade, a million Puerto Ricans, and that night Puerto Rican kill another Puerto Rican at a bodega that night, right? So where's the pride? Black excellence, black pride, black lives matter. And, and, and they get caught up in these colors in this gang where we just need them a little, we, we need to embrace them and show them that much more love so they can look past that and say, yo, that's my brother, that's mm -hmm. my cousin. Mm -hmm. I love them. Um, and I know that there's something there with what I told you right now. You know, there's something to that. You know, the other thing, too, to me is that um, we got to try to provide some options for these young people. Like, they don't feel like they, they you know, like, hey, this, that's their life. If, if they knew that, hey, you know what, I can be Fat Joe or I can be Larry Miller. I can be, they see, to your point earlier, they see somebody that looks like them. Yeah. Maybe then we can inspire them to like, you know, put the gun down and pick up a book. You know what I mean? I'm gonna shout out Andy, that's your name, man? Andy and this beautiful library for having us. Everybody, round of applause, <laughs> right? <laughs> Second question, what is your greatest source of strength and what's your greatest gift? I believe that's the question. <clears throat> um, well, my sort, greatest source of strength is God, Allah. I mean, I, 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 th there's no question. That's what. Um, if it wasn't for, if it wasn't for God, I know I wouldn't have made made it through any of this. I was talking with some of my my friends one time. We were saying, hey, every day we would go out the house trying to kill ourselves. I mean, that was our every day. We go out the stuff that we were doing. We were trying to kill ourselves it was by the grace of God that we didn't. And it wasn't us that saved us. It was really God that saved us. So, you know, there's no question in my mind that, you know, I'm, I've been blessed beyond my wildest dreams. Oof. And, you know, that's one of the reasons, too, that I decided to do this because um, I feel like I've been so blessed that if I didn't tell this story and share this story, then I wouldn't be showing how grateful I am and showing my gratitude for what for how blessed I've been in my in my life, so that's that's my greatest source of strength. And then what was the other one? Fear. Uh, your fear. greatest gift. Oh greatest my, fear. no greatest gift. fear. Gift. Yeah, I wrote it. <laughs> Did you write this in cursive or something? About, or yes. in Egyptian? Oh. I don't know what's going on, man. It's looking like <laughs> Gr greatest fear. I um. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't, at this point, I guess, you know, now that I've put this story out there and I've shared this, you know, my greatest fear used to be getting found out, getting discovered, somebody finding out about my past. That's, that's gone. I almost cursed it. But that, that's, that's, that, that's, that's done now. So, you know, I, I, I don't know. I guess, um, you know, my greatest fear is that, you know, we don't, figure out a way to change things in this country and we don't figure out a way to change things in our communities and to help you know young people turn their lives around I mean that's I, that's my biggest concern and that's again why why we decided to do this is so that we can you know hopefully add some positive to the situation that's out there you just answered the next question with that <laughs> one right there the ultimate goal of the book is it to, yep, we got that one. <laughs> and just some of you guys are writing so small. And Fat Joe don't look old, but he old and his eyes getting bad. So, you know, I might need one of them yallas. I said, would you talk about you are not the exception, but how much talent and potential there is given when they give you a second chance? That's what we was talking about about how much power is it, not just you being like Larry Miller, the, the greatest ever live, uh, that other people can also use that type of opportunity. In, in well, I mean, I, I, know, I know a lot of brothers who have gotten out and are doing good. You know what I mean? They're, you know, they've built great lives. They've, you know, have families. They've, they've changed their life. And I know a lot of brothers who've done that. I think, you know, because of 
the jobs that I've been in and the people that I've kind of been associated with, you know, my story may attract some people that, you know, maybe it wouldn't otherwise. But I know a lot of brothers who've gotten out and are doing good. So it's not, um, you know, I, I think I, I'm kind of an exception, but there are a lot of exceptions. But I do think the key is, uh, you know, again, providing opportunities for people to feel like they can change their life and that and to believe that they can do something different with their life. And I think, um, you know, that again, that's that's the purpose for us doing this. And, you know, we're we I, I really believe that, um, you know, that I know for a fact some of the smartest, most creative, intelligent people I ever met, I met in jail. And if you can harness that creativity, if you can harness that intelligence and, and focus it in a, in a positive direction, I think, uh, you know, those, and, and, and again, those are the brothers that understand, brothers and sisters, that understand what's going on in the street. And if you can get their minds changed and they can bring that back and focus that positive energy into the street, I think that's, that's one of the things that can help us move forward. You know, it's really crazy because you, for a split second, you made me think about the brother Isaac Wright Jr. If y'all seen that that TV show for life, this guy was falsely convicted and became a lawyer in jail and got 20 people off of life in jail and then came home and became a lawyer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now he, 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 he's a lawyer in the same courtroom that, mm -hmm. um, that they, they convicted him. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, he ran for mayor in New York City. And, and I endorsed him along with maybe one other person. He lost, but I, I, I went for him on principle. I thought that the, the story was amazing. It was incredible. And I wanted to support him. Let me see the book for a second. This book, guys, is called A Jump, right? And it's very powerful. It's a very powerful uh, piece of literature. And so we encourage everybody to read this book and to talk about it. Don't keep the secret to yourself. But you know what happens when you read uh, a book like this? Now, Andy, I don't know if he knows about my rap career. Andy, we have not cursed today, but I have to say one. <laughs> Once you read this book, you know you done fucked up, right? <laughs> Because now you know that anything's possible. You could grow from poverty, go to jail. Anything is possible. And so I encourage us all to spread the word, keep it moving, because you know, things like this, we can't let this get swept under the rug. Uh, the man is telling you time and time again, it's weird, it's, it's really weird, because you know, I'm into people, right? And, I, and I, I'm damn near, I'm one million percent I'm a therapist. Like one million percent I'm a therapist. I'm one million percent, right? I'm dealing with the craziest people. But somebody so powerful as you, somebody who came from nothing, who's a chairman, who ran the, the Portland Trailblazers, you still had a problem. You had a flaw. Your flaw was, I don't want nobody to know about what I went through because and then they might look at me different than this and this. And, and, and as you know, we, we got powerful friends. And, every, and, and when I hear them keep saying something all the time, I say, damn, he got a problem with it, mm. right? And so I'm glad you got over your fear and you're able to inspire millions because I believe that this is going to turn into a TV show or a movie or a documentary. <laughs> That's what I believe. Um, and so, Andy, would, anything we want to say about the library? Or any, this is a beautiful place. I want y'all to come in here, read the books. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Andy. Yes. Right. Thank you.